All right. Hey, thing live. Let's see if um, got a couple of you here. Let me know who's watching, where you're watching from, and let me know too if you already RV uh, full time and you just had more questions, or if you're like starting from scratch. That way, uh, I kind of have an idea of where uh, where to start for this. And the big things I'm going to cover today because I uh, I need to try to keep this under an hour since I thought we were going to late check out of our campground and they said we cannot late check out. So I have to make sure we're finishing it, wrapping this up in an hour at one so we can hitch up and drive on. But the big thing is I wanted to cover in this because an hour is probably not enough time to cover everything is to cover um, like the rational and the irrational parts of RV living, because I don't think that many people are talking about the rational parts. Um, I mean, people think in terms of like, well, what does it cost? And how do you figure out which campground to stay in? And um, what do you do about driver's license? And what do you do about uh, having, you know, your homeschooling? I'm not even gonna touch on homeschooling today because homeschooling um, is its own, like that's a long content. So, uh, well, we're not going to talk about exactly that, but I am going to talk about um, kind of the rational part of going into 2022, kind of where I see things. You know, we've traveled through a lot of states through this um, new this new world, um, this post-pandemic world that we live in and kind of giving because I have my feet on the ground and um and living it and what I'm seeing from state to state and in terms of, I think that makes a huge difference in what you decide to do going forward. And I do also, I'm going to a um, freedom and economics uh, convention this weekend. So it'll add more insight, but I followed a lot of these things and I'm seeing what, you know, they're saying there's only what 5% inflation, which is not true. It's, it's more than that. But on top of it, where the inflation is heading. So let's start off with like one of the rational things of, uh, you know, we moved into our RV uh, in 2015 and we, nobody was doing it then. It was like, I did it completely irrationally or out of irrational intentions with somebody who I had to present it in rational terms, meaning. I came to Victor and said, like, hey, we have to move out of this house that we're living in. Remember, 2015, not many people were doing this. And there was an Instagram with full-time tra travel families and all that. So I go, okay, I had the irrational desire to enjoy life. I didn't know many people around me that were like, oh, my gosh, you should absolutely live life to the fullest. You should chase your passions and dreams. I just happen to be wired, which I'm going to talk about more. I just happen to be wired that way. If something sounds amazing to me, I am not scared to take the risk and go for it. And I'm very intentional with homeschooling, with the activities we do, where we travel to. Everything for me is like, if I have the spark of desire, if I have an intention to create a certain feeling of joy and happiness, I just go. That is not the norm. And I understand that. So I want to help you with like finding this in have said like oh my gosh he didn't even he wouldn't even have said like oh it sounds joyful to go in an rv he did like nothing of that and i'll get into that with personality typing no no there wasn't even a thought process so i presented it like hey we rent a house on on the beach it was this was in 2013 to 2015 we rent a house on the beach our life was pretty darn good you know we'd wake up and go surf in the morning and go for bike rides it was a gorgeous place to live it, not a lot of, um, the only traffic were the dolphins swimming by in the ocean, but it was expensive. It was like 3,500 for rent. Plus our business in Coronado was another like 3,500 in rent. Food was expensive. Like I remember to break even, we had to be, uh, grossing about 13 to $15,000 a month to break even six years ago. And I remember thinking, this is silly, like this is so much money. And on top of it, yes, it's nice that we go to the beach and surf and yes, it's nice, but I hated the routine. I could not stand the grind. I couldn't stand that. I was like, it's all nice people around me, but I'd see the same faces every day. I'd have to have the same conversations. For me, just that alone would be the irrational reason that moving into an RV was totally worth it because I didn't want to live the rest of my life on repeat. I didn't want to have the same conversation. I didn't want to see the same people. They were all great people, but there was not there was no joy for for me. 
I could not stand the, the like, oh, so what are you what are you making for dinner? What is your husband doing today? What is it like that part of life was just so boring for me. And to me, I think if it's not exciting and passionate, you're not going to put the effort into it. Flip side is for Victor, he like he kind of liked that predictability. He he liked that stability. He didn't really have any desire if every day was the same forever. That's all he had ever known growing up. So he thought, well, that's all. Um, that must be all there is to it. So I do always say Victor has one thing is like that he is extremely passionate about being married to me. And so he's always just like, whatever you want, whatever you want, whatever you want, really doesn't care. And that's okay too. I mean, for me, it works out good most of the time in, in um, the realm of RV living. I usually say like, I don't think you should start there. I really don't in a cup. If you're in a relationship, you should start at alignment in intention. Uh, but some people aren't, aren't, uh, they don't have the tools to use their third eye to be able to see what their intention is. They don't know any different. Society doesn't raise us to think differently. That's why if this is the case for you, I'm going to say it at the end of this presentation, but you need to come to my webinar on the 20th, where I'm going to talk more about overcoming programming, self-limiting beliefs, why society keeps you trapped in this, in that grind. But for this, let's stay on RV living. So number one rational part is I told him, hey, we're going to save a ton of money if we just live in our RV for a few months. Okay. And that would be where I would tell you to start off right now. Probably going to see another 10% inflation next year. It might be even more as the next three or four years go on until things kind of cycle through. And so if you live in a house where, and, and you have to look at the what your house costs, the job security you think you have with all these uh, mandates coming through. If you think like my current job isn't even going to cover if there's 20% inflation over the next year or two, then possibly downsizing to an RV might be just rationally smart. It might be the best thing to do is just to um, cut your costs. I mean, when we went from needing to gross 13 to 15,000 a month to, I'll go into how we paid cat, we saved up, we paid cash um, for an RV. Um, I'll go into that hopefully um, in about, towards the end of that, I'll get to that part. But if you have, uh, a big house payment, or you could cash out of your house right now and get into a, an RV. My big thing is say, get into the cheapest one you can to start with to make sure you like it. Um, you know, Instagram shows all the, everybody's beautiful RVs, fully remodeled, and they look so pretty, and that's great, but that's a lot of money. And if you're not handy, then you don't want to let something like that be your limitation. Um, so we, for us, we... We went from 15000 13 to 15000 to literally after we bought the RV, moved into the RV, we only had to make 5000 We only had to really pay. We ended up making more than that, but we ended up only having, as far as expenses, campgrounds. It's a wide range. I'm going to go through that. But campgrounds, food, um, just like insurance for cars and, and vehicles. Okay? I'm going to tell you. We spend way more on food than most people probably spend on food, but we haven't been to a doctor in 12 years, 10 years. I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't know any better. So we went when I had Jariah and ended up um, delivering him in the hospital. But after that, we did not go back to a doctor's and, you know, so we don't pay for health insurance. So people are like, oh, but health insurance is 1700 And like, I can't spend, we spend $3,000 on food a month. Maybe some months it's 2,600 on it, but really like it's, there's no way for us to go around the fact that our major expense is food. That one's the, the done deal. We spend a lot on really good food. And that is probably my biggest concern with living in an RV still is the ability to get that good food. What I'm, um, my tip is like everywhere I go, I just Google butcher near me. And I usually can find like in Kentucky, I found these great butchers. It was really cheap. When I'm in Montana, I stock up on meat there. I know to find ranchers there. Um, if I was driving through um, Texas, I'd probably like just look up butcher near me, find a rancher, uh, get a cow from them. 
we have carried at one point two deep freezers in our fifth wheel in order to have good food at all times. That's my personal rational brain or rational fear that might seem irrational to others, but to me, food is the, the one thing I don't budge on. And then in addition to that, we have certain supplements like uh, we, we get the really good coffee, we get our mud, things like that that I get every month. I make sure I find either we ship it to our home base in Montana, which we haven't been to in a while. We'll either ship a couple there and then I have it stocked or I find a campground that we're going to sit still in and I plan ahead a little bit. That's a little, like most people aren't as picky about stuff like that as I am. Although if you want to save money on your health insurance, that might be worth doing. So rationally, we moved into the RV with like, oh, we'll save money. And then after five months, Victor's like, oh man, you're so happy. Like, why would I, why would I take this away? And so after that point for us, it's irrational in the sense that, uh, hey, this sparks a lot of joy. I just, we just start from there. That was, that was the first step. So your first, sorry, your first step is to decide, and I say this for everything we do, whether it's homeschooling, whether it's fitness, everything I coach people on. Step one is, what's your intention? Like, what do you, what, what's the goal? What's the goal in life, actually, is your really big question. Is is your goal to, like, grind it out? Is your highest goal safety and security and that you've told yourself that safety and security is in a house? I mean, the uh, there's unpredictability no matter what. I think in the last 20 months have shown us that it's hard to predict everything. Um, there's There are no promises, and so... Sometimes the easier way is to work on your own ability to adapt instead of looking extrinsically. That's my thing. That's what I coach people on. I'm trying to change your perspective internally instead of looking to the external answers. So knowing for me, my intention for RV living aligned with a lot of my value system. And so starting by knowing what's your value system and what uh, do you want to get, what do you want your days to look like? I will put links down below on worksheets that I have people do when they first start um, any wellness program with me. It comes down to like, what sparks joy? If money weren't an object, what would you do? Um, who do you like to surround yourself with? Um, how? What's a perfect day? That's the easiest one. What is a perfect day? And so for me, I thought the perfect day for me is to wake up in nature with a sport outside my front door. That's it. We've spent six and a half years for that one thing. I like to wake up. We're in Santos campground today. There's mountain biking right here. Tomorrow, we're going to wake up and be at Sebastian Inlet and they'll be surfing right there. My goal in life is to wake up somewhere every day where there's some form of outdoor activity. It doesn't always have to be the most epic thing, but it needs to be, I have, have to have something physical to do outdoors on top of it because we tried Polson, we tried Montana and we had this great gym, but I wouldn't even go to the gym in our garage to work out. I needed something outside to go do. And so then I just run, but that's a different side note. So your number one step is to be really, really clear on why you would do it in the first place. Because if you take just the rational oh, it's going to save me money or vice versa. Oh, I should stay in this house because what if, what if inflation goes high and I can't find a job? Look, every single town has help wanted signs. Not that I'm telling you to work at McDonald's. I'm just saying if you're, if you're letting the thought of, well, I'll never find work. Like now is probably the easiest time to find work. You probably have a skill set that you can do more than just working at McDonald's. But if you let the um, limitation of, I don't, I don't know how to make money stand in your way, then you're bringing in two ideas. We have to hold them separately. You have to be like, happiness, is this what life's supposed to be around, about? And then, okay, now how can I use that skill set to uh, fuel or fund this passion, right? We don't look at life like that. Most of the time we look at life is like, well, this is the job I have, and I'm going to tell you a hundred reasons why I should keep it. Nobody asks you, well, like, does it make you happy? Does it, is it what you want to do? And so you have to be able to, to work on both, but you start on this side. You definitely start on like what it is. Then next is you can, step two will be to assess 
where you're at as far as like rational or irrational. You know, maybe maybe that job is really good and you have to step back and go, okay, well, maybe RV living is me seeking something else. But, you know, maybe I could recreate that in my existing life without having to sell all my belongings because it is a lot of work. I'm not going to tell you it's easy to sell all your belongings. It um, definitely takes flexing a totally different muscle than a lot of people have. Um, so knowing where you're at as far as those two things, I like this. Could I make some small changes? Okay. Could I test it? For us, we had tested. We didn't camp at all when we had our kids were younger. It wasn't until uh, Jariah was about a year old. He's our fourth. And we went on a road trip. I rented an RV. Um, if I back up a little bit, it was because Victor was in adrenal exhaustion, which I think a lot of people are struggling with right now. He was in adrenal exhaustion. Yeah, you'd call it maybe midlife crisis, extremely. He was like totally so tired. He could barely get through a workout, could barely get through his work day, like crying, depressed, and then go to anxiety. And I'm just like, whoa, what is going on with you? And at the time, it took us a little while to figure it out. But, you know, he had, he had food allergies, too much stress, had to have a total lifestyle change. But the good thing that came out of that is we went to Hawaii twice in one year because I was at my limit with four kids and homeschooling and running a business. I couldn't take it. And I remember standing on the beach in Hawaii, looking around, going like, yeah, this is nice, but I don't want to come back here ever. I don't, not ever again, but I don't really want to come back here for a long time. I knew I needed some feeling of freedom. So not, I don't know if everybody clues into that as well. I know not everybody clues into that, but I knew that there was a feeling inside me like, gosh, I mean, I know I should be grateful. I mean, it's Hawaii. It should be grateful, but it's so boring to me. I don't want to just sit on a beach anymore. I want to, I want to explore. I kind of wanted more challenge, but I didn't know. I was just, I had gone from high school to college to owning a business and having four kids like that. There wasn't this chance to go, oh, hmm, what would make me happy? So you really need to assess and like get, get out a pen, get out a notebook, write it all down. Like, okay, what am I trying to accomplish with RV living? Draw a line down the middle, rational, irrational. Value them both equally. Okay. Um, as uh, I'm going to talk about right now, mindset and personality typing is probably your uh, number one asset to help you with this because I, I think even on our YouTube channel, Isabel and I have a um, what each Enneagram uh, would look like RV living or how they do. But let's be honest, like, for, for certain personality types, the mindset around winging it or challenge is going to be a little bit easier. And the mindset around uh, unpredictability, wanting to everything to stay perfect. I mean, I immediately think of like, if you're a type one, it's, it's doable, but you have to be very healthy in your type one to know you're called the perfectionist. If you're watching, you don't know Enneagram, you're the perfectionist. And I mean, sand gets in your, if you have kids like dirt and sand, get in your RV all the time. Can you keep it perfect? Well, yeah, you have to use your throat chakra and be like, look, here's a bucket of water before you walk in the RV, wash your feet off. Uh, here's a towel and you, you choose your battles, but then that, that means you have to be like, okay, I'm going to choose my battles and I'm not going to let these wear me down. And I'm going to make sure I voice what, what those boundaries are for me. It's, it sounds super simple, but it's not hard. It's uh, really hard for people to see that in themselves that, oh, wow, I have this core desire for blank. And if I don't meet that core desire, I turn into somebody I don't want to be. Uh, maybe a house is causing that and maybe in an RV, it wouldn't cause that. So I also will put a link below besides those worksheets. I will also put my Enneagram cheat sheet worksheets because those are pretty um, powerful. If you see really quick, like, oh man, my um, core desire is this, but my biggest fears are this. And your fears are um, unpredictability. You know, for a type two, if my husband is, the, the unpredictability or the lack of stability is really, really, really hard. So, I mean, I didn't have him... It would have been too long if we both recorded this because he talks just as much as I talk. So he'll do another one. But if he was here, in fact, I asked him, I took notes and I said, okay, pretend I died. Would you keep living in an RV? 
He's like, what do you mean you died? How did you die? Like, no, 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 stick to the point. If I died, what would you do? Would you go back to Paulson? Would you go back to California? What would you do? If I put you in that position to choose, and he said, well, I would keep living in an RV. And I go, okay, so why? So for somebody like him who it's taken six years to like be kind of confident, like I would choose this again, he has to stay focused on three reasons why. It's rational. His overhead is lower, meaning he doesn't have to make as much money. He's outside in nature. Well, if you look at the type two cheat sheets, they need a lot of time in nature. So that right there, you have to put a kind of a higher value score on that to be like, oh, I love being in nature. I need to value it. When, when we lived in California and had a business for 20 years, I'm not kidding that my husband spent 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the gym for about 15 years of his life. And he's a type two and he needs to be in nature, not moving, not like me. I need to be in nature, like constantly moving. He needs to just like sit under a tree and stare at birds. That's why we'd go to Hawaii so much because he would just go to the beach, sit there and stare at waves for hours on end. And that's okay. That's a really good thing. It's the hard part is when you don't know that that's what you need and you're not in that core desire. So his was lower overhead, more outside. And as a type two, you care about the people around you so much. And so he sees everyone else. His kids are so happy. I'm so happy. Everyone else is so happy. So for him, he has to be very disciplined to step back and go, oh, wait, these three things are what are the values that I have to stay aligned to in order to get upset when the truck breaks down or when I get a flat tire or when things break or on the RV or all these other things that are possibly going to go wrong or um, man, I got to talk faster huh, to get through all this. So mindset. I personally am like, uh, my one of my favorite movies is The Martian. I thrive on the idea of like you solve one problem, then you solve the next, then you solve the next. I mean, all of our travels, uh, I don't know if you know, have followed us long enough to know like we've gone, we went six months to uh, Europe in 2016, just with backpacks and a huge coffin surf, surfboard bag, tents and uh, rock climbing gear. We did the same thing for like a month in Bali, a month in New Zealand, Hawaii. Uh, we've gone to Costa Rica, Nicaragua many times. Like we, I love the feeling of like, all right, we're gonna land, we're gonna find a rental car, we're gonna find a rental car, and then we're gonna, um, we're, we got to Norway, I'm like, well, we're just gonna drive. I'm sure we'll come across a campground, which we did, but it was like midnight and the sun's still out and we're in Norway, our first night in Europe and making beans and rice in their little camper's kitchen while the kids are jumping on a trampoline and it's midnight, but it's light. It, I think that was, that was my goal. That was my value system. I'm like I want newness. I am willing to tough it out for most things. Uh, there are some that I know my boundaries now. I really don't love the cold weather. So we find some of those things. Uh, one of the things Victor said with two, I said, well, where would you go? Because I do all the planning an over planner. I don't think you have to be one type. I do notice though that it seems like most people who do thrive better in full-time RVing tend to be more prospecting types. If you're like, if you're familiar with the MBTI, Myers-Briggs Hunting Indicator, which again, that's our person. I'll put another link. That's three links I got to remember. The Precision Personality Hacker kind of works the Enneagram backwards. I kind of walk you through how to type correctly for your MBTI and then figure out your Enneagram. But if you're a judging type, you tend to like, especially if you're an SJ type, sensory judging, you like routine, predictability, you have a list for everything, you're super organized. I still kind of think RV living could be harder for you in this case. It's not impossible. It's just, you need more intention and a slower pace. I know a lot of people who are prospecting types, P type and, they sit still and want, they'll find a boondocking spot. They sit still there for months on end, weeks on end, whatever, and are just really chill. Most of them are heading to Mexico for the winter right now. And that's awesome too. It didn't align with my, with what I want out of our travels. I think we um, are a little bit of an exception that we travel really fast for how long we've done this. I keep saying, I think maybe like 10 years into it, I'll finally travel slower maybe, but that's, it doesn't make it right or wrong. 
I know the one big thing is Victor said he just chase 70 degrees. And if you are on Instagram or following a lot of people on YouTube here for full-time RV, they tend to stay in the South in the winter. They're, they're again, looking for 70. It's just easier. It's not uh, un, unheard of. A lot of full-time RVers do go into Colorado and Montana and Idaho for ski season, but it's harder and you have to have the right the right type of uh, rig that's that has a good four season insulation. Um, he also mentioned that he would go with a much shorter RV. He would still choose a fifth wheel, but he would choose a shorter fifth wheel than ours. Ours is 42 foot. I do all the driving because of the fact that I love to drive it. I don't, I like challenge and it stresses him out so much that I don't like to be around him after he does it or if he drives. So for us that works. Um, you know, if having that one, when I get to the RV section, I'll tell you, but for him, he's like, well, I'd be comfortable driving a fifth wheel, but I would just want it so much shorter because those last few feet do make a huge difference. Um, so as far as personality type and mindset, I think uh, knowing uh, what you tend towards in, in terms of that, and it seems like a common theme that opposites attract in marriages. And so you end up with, um, these SJ types and these NP types. I'm not an NP, I'm an NJ type, but um, I kind of tend to, as I get older, lean a little bit more and more towards being a little bit more P or trying to find that prospecting element in my travel. So you're going to have to have the hard conversation of, if I went back, I would never change anything other than I would probably like hold, uh, pin my husband down big. You have to say, you have to write out your intention of what you want out of this. And if his intention would probably go like something like this, for my wife to be happy, so it was successful. I'm, I'm happy. But but then you have that intention like, well, you can't get upset when this breaks or when this happens and that happens because your intention was for me to be happy. Um, being really clear with what, what that rational and irrational, like I talked about at the beginning, um, the one I think most people given uh, the state of the world, is you're chasing safety and security that tends to be an illusion when i work with clients i'm always working on the chakras as a foundation that doesn't mean um it's anything outside of religion it's just you have energetic hubs in your body that control how you interact in the world your thought processes um actually your physical health on top of it. So what happens is if you have, say, a blocked root chakra or you have a tendency to be fearful, if you are struggling with panic attacks, if you have, if you consider yourself an anxious person, they're all one and the same. There's a root chakra blockage there. And that element of safety and security, you don't want to take that struggle with you into RV living because things are more unpredictable. And so you're going to be all, always looking for, you're going to be always on the defense. And it's easy to actually unblock that. It's easy to work around that. But it, the easiest way is with intention. So having really good clarity or working on deprogramming, whatever that root cause of trauma or programming is that caused that blockage to begin with. So safety and security is something that for us, uh, I have said, like, I think I feel very safe and secure when we're traveling through most states. We kind of stay outside out of big cities though. So if you were worried like, well, is it safe to be in an RV and traveling right now? I mean, it's, it's not political, but red states are a little bit more open. You don't have to worry about, um, things being closed, not being able to get food as much, not being able to, I mean, I'm going to tell you in Florida, there's, there's no shortages yet. I, um, there's, there haven't been any troubles finding campgrounds. So that part is, isn't that, that difficult as far as safety and security. But I think it's important to also know that you need a community. So there are a lot of like-minded people that you can find and align yourself with and groups that, um, I mean, even in the Freedom Cell Network, there are a lot of people that have land, so you have a place to run to because for us, you know, we keep this land in Montana as kind of like a home base if we needed to run back to, but if you think about the scenarios where you would have to run back, um, you're, you have to sometimes 
at least for me, I can play out too many scenarios and then I go, okay, we're going to play our odds now. Come on. What are the odds of that happening? And if those things do happen, you're not good anywhere. So sometimes safety and safety and security becomes this illusion that we um, kind of hide behind and we're, we think is safer. Now, I'm going to tell you the antithesis of that is in some ways being mobile makes you a little bit you're not stuck in, you know, um, those smart cities. You're not stuck in, um, in the grid. And you uh, get to detox your body in trees so much more, in nature. And you get to ground because one of the best things I think about keeping a healthy living in an RV is you're barefoot a little bit more often. Your feet are in the ground. And that makes a big difference in your overall health. And if your health is better, then, of course, you're going to feel more safety and security. So that's a little bit on root chakra. Uh, we have, I can tell, tell you so many stories about why RV living was hard for us because Victor's blocked root chakra. I think there's plenty of podcasts on that. But um, the big thing is that we, you know, willingness to problem solve, like the Martian, the willingness to just like this happens create a fund, a, a separate fund. Like we had a little bit of money we set aside, like, hey, if we have a flat tire, if an injector goes out, it's part of it. Um, make sure your in insurance. I did have one time where I didn't realize for uh, Geico is a good insurance to have for RVing. And I didn't realize that I didn't have the like roadside assistance on our truck set up. And I kid you not, it was probably like 15 cents a month to have this added. And our truck broke down in the middle of nowhere in uh, uh, Kolob Canyon, I think, outside of Zion. No cell service. We had to hitch a ride back to the campground. And then I knew a mechanic. And the mechanic drove, um, called a tow truck that he knew. And I went with the tow truck to go get the truck. And then to the mechanic where he let me borrow his car for a couple days. It worked out great. That would be my, that you can look at it as a win, a loss. The thing is, is that people are willing to help you. There are so many good people out there. So if you're used to being kind of a strong, independent person that isn't very reliant on others, I think the willingness to ask for help and to accept help uh, was something that took us a long time to learn. But in that case, I ended up having to pay $300 for the tow truck when I could have been paying 15 cents a month. But I, I kind of at this point just let those things go like, oh, silly mistake. Oh, well. Uh, there was a time I wouldn't have been like that. There was a time where I would have beat myself up a lot for making that kind of mistake. I can step back now and just kind of look at the big picture of it. It probably helps to see that my kids are safe. They're, you know, a couple of them are adults that they've grown up and that it worked out. It's probably also what helps me be more vocal about this is because I feel like, oh, before I like, well, I know this is going to work, but I don't have proof to show people, but it does work now. And so now I can say I have proof. It works. It does have it. It, it works. And this is how it worked. So safety and security really step into like, do I need to think about my um, healing my root chakra so that I have enough bravery to to enter this? A willingness to fail, to learn, to ask. Um, uh, belief systems is... I don't want to go too much into it. This is, again, what I'm going to talk about on the 20th when I do um, my other webinar. But you probably don't realize you have a belief system about how life should be or about how. And if you don't already live in an RV or you're thinking you're thinking about it, but you're not actually pulling the trigger, it's a belief system that's causing you to watch this. It's a belief system that hasn't made you pull the trigger. And that belief system could be. Uh, fear of failure, uh, fear of acceptance, um, fear of unworthiness, fear of not, uh, fear of you know rejection. I get this one all the time. Nobody really gets me in my family. Nobody really gets Victor in their, his family. That's okay. They don't. It, their job isn't to get us. Their job is to to figure themselves out. Honestly, like they they can't. You can't go around making everybody happy especially in a world where people don't even know how to make themselves happy. So being able to step into that selfless selfishness and not worry about like, well, what is going to happen takes work, takes deconstructing all those belief systems. Why do I do what, what I do? Okay. So let's get into the actual costs of RVing. If you were 
going to step into RVing. Uh, I have a lot of people asking right now, you guys have five, five kids or seven of you. How do you guys do it? Do you have two vehicles? No, we squish into our truck. We have a big, um, for, I think one, two, four years, pretty much. We lived in a class seat. Our kids at the time were age. She's Tati was probably four, four, six, nine, 13, 14, about there. And beds were the number one concern at that point or sleeping. And so for a class C, it worked really good because you'd have the cab over top. You put, um, the boys were up there. The table, Isabel was short enough to be on the table that broke down to a bed. The couch opened up to a bed for uh, Gabby. And then Tatiana was really little, so she'd sleep back there with Victor and I and in the back room. When kids are young and you're worried about car seats, actually before our class C, we had a class A. We had um, a really nice class A uh, diesel pusher that, and that was when Dry was still in a car seat. And that one was good too. We didn't uh, live full time in that. That was just what we had first started traveling in when I came back from Hawaii and said, I am not going back to Hawaii. We need an RV. And we did. We took a road trip first to uh, with a rental. And then the next month we went and bought a class A. The class A was nice um, in the terms that it slept everybody to some extent a little bit better, but we had bunk beds. And the bad thing with the bunk beds is the first night, Gabby was on the top, she fell out. Then, okay, we'll have to put a rail up and and it worked out okay. And Jariah was still young enough that I could just put him in a playpen. Uh, the point is you really, really have to think through sleeping first, I think. Because now we're in this fifth wheel. It's huge. We've got four beds in the back. But I have two kids that are adults that don't fit in the beds. Actually, I have three kids that don't fit in the beds in the back. So now I've got only two can be, because the top bunk is really uh, narrow. And so um, they, uh, the, 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 uh, you're distracting me, Victor. Um, they, you should just come out here instead of distracting me this. But he did say, I wish I knew all this before we started. Um, they, uh, the top, the top bunks are narrow. So it's not even so much that they're not, that they're too tall. Cause I don't have that tall of kids, but it's like, you know, you can't sleep like this as a mummy every single night and be comfortable and happy. So we ripped out uh, the table and the couch and put futons there. So two are there. I can go through all the different scenarios. The point is, if you take the step, you're like, all right, I know my personality. I'm aligned. I'm ready. I'm predicting out. These are my pitfalls that I'm going to see based on my personality. But my core desire is higher. And I logically am going to beat inflation with this mode of going. Step one, you go look at a ton of RVs and you think sleeping. And then you remember that your kids grow and they grow fast. So if if they're growing and they, um, you know, you're, I doubt you're going to pick one RV and be like, this is the RV I'm going to have for the next 10 years. That's silly. Everybody I know who full times RVs seems like they switch RVs every couple of years. Uh, we have one, like I said, for four years. We have this one for two years and I'm about ready to get a new one. So... You hear that, Victor? We're getting a new one. Okay, so on top of the sleeping, then comes driving. Um, not Let's not even talk about what you're capable of driving because anybody can learn to tow a trailer. Uh, it might take you some practice, but I didn't know how. You, just, you can learn this. But driving, like, where do you want to drive? How often do you want to drive? We are one of the few people I know that have a big fifth wheel and change campground like every three nights. It's a big deal when we stay put for longer, but I don't mind. I don't mind the work. I, it aligns with my higher value of seeing new places. And I don't want a different RV. I love a fifth wheel. So because uh, Danny's not always with us, or if he's with us, it's usually either Danny or Victor are working. So most of the time when we get somewhere, we you know, unhitch and like one of them stays back and then there's only six in the truck and it's great. But when we have to go from point A to point B in campgrounds, we all squish in the truck and it works. It's a, sometimes it's a little bit long. Eventually we'll just get another truck. But right now to go from Florida all the way to Montana 
uh, I think that's close to 3,000 miles. That's a lot of money in gas on two vehicles. So we're not going to go that route yet. Uh, you should think about, though, in terms of are you going to want, where are you going to want to go? What are you going to want to see? And don't forget that inflation is coming. What is it? Gas in California is over $6 a gallon, I think. So keep that in mind, too. If you're on a budget, you might not be wanting to go to California besides the fact that they have um, so many regulations. I have a, let's see if I pull it up on my phone. I use this app. Well, I was gonna show you. I use Gas Buddy. And then I, I would in my planning, even before we go for road trips, uh, remember I'm an over planner. I go and search out um, what gas prices are, just so that I know right now we don't have to budget so tightly, but if I know we're gonna be driving through Arkansas, Kansas City, or Kansas, and Nebraska on my way back to Montana, I'll look ahead of time and just be like, oh, I'm curious, what are gas prices currently at? And then you can calculate your, um, how many uh, miles a gallon your vehicle gets, you know, ours used to get like 15, our Class C gets about 10 right now because I haven't fixed the injector. Uh, it's probably getting like seven to eight. Um, that's Those are all really important for us because we travel fast. Our gas bill is, is about $900 a month right now, but we're, we're moving quickly uh, for depending on what vehicle you, you decide to go with. And I feel like if I'm going to go into really good detail about campgrounds or sorry about what RV to buy what are you going to want to sleep where are you want to, going to want to go if if you want to get into national parks national parks it's hard with the big rig I don't take my 42 foot fifth wheel into our national parks but that's why we bought a class C to begin with is because we knew we wanted to go into national parks a lot so class C made it easier do you want to go one place drop your trailer stay there for a week and then take your truck or van and go to lots of different places around. That's kind of what we're doing on this Florida trip. I actually don't like this kind of travel as much, but I like the fifth wheel that has a bedroom in the front and lots more space. So I choose, it's, it's a give and take. I don't think there's a perfect. I think you should just pick what's perfect for you for now and for the next maybe 18 months. I think if you, I think too much of life Remember that first thing, what sparks joy? Too much of life's decisions are based on what you expect things to look like in 10 years. Like just live a little bit more in the present moment. What would spark joy now? If we're in our class C, we were able to, it's just so much more fun to be able to, for us at least, to get to one destination, do something fun, drive another 50 miles or stay put for a couple days, but to just kind of constantly be moving, that's how it allowed us to, you know, loop the U.S. so many times or drive to Alaska. Or, I mean, it would have made it so that I could could have done a lot more things here in Florida. Uh, it just, that, that RV is just too tight now for the number of people, of not even kids, because four of us are adults. There's just too many of us in that space. It is great when I go on a ski trip, which is five, with just the three or uh, four kids and myself, it fits us great for five. Um, some people ask me about if you have five kids. I personally, if I was going to go back to do it, I would have kept, we used to have a 15 passenger Chevy van. I would have kept that and just got a, a trailer and towed like a, a regular trailer, not a fifth wheel. Pro at some point I would have switched from the class C to that, but we, um, we had different dynamics at that point. But anyways, that would probably be the way because having a, Having a big passenger van is just without that many kids is so much easier. We would take out one of the seats so there's room to like throw all your stuff or to, um, or even to you know like put in your gear. Um, what else? It, it was just, it was so easy, so much easier that way. Um, slide outs are important. I would not. I mean, I was looking right now. There's like three airstreams around. No, four, five. Maybe there's an airstream conference here or something. Because actually there's six out of 22 sites, there's six Airstreams next to me. And I mean, Airstreams are great. They look cool, but you know, to, it looks nice and you can redecorate them, but you don't have slide outs. And it's, I think it makes a huge difference being able to open everything up and have some space. Um, you know, you can, you can choose for yourself. 
Uh, the residency we go through, I have a blog on this, so I'm not going to repeat all of it, but we use South Dakota, uh, choosesd.com for residency. It's super easy. Uh, you just have to plan ahead a little bit because it's hard to get an appointment at DMV. But then you, we use Choose SD for our mail service, and they will forward our mail wherever we want. Our problem is we travel so fast that I'm never at a campground long enough to receive mail ahead of time. But I do believe you can set it up like with um, like UPS stores to have things shipped there and then keep them there. I have not done that. Uh, just for us, it does work that I, I, we don't order much. So I don't really have even mail. They'll, if we get bills or we don't even have bills. But if, when the IRS wants to call us for you know, taxes or something or get a hold of us, they send our, they send our mail there. They'll scan it and email it to you. And then you can look at it. I'm just kidding. The IRS doesn't come after us. Um, insurance is, I mentioned through Geico is, is pretty easy. I did notice though that it's a little bit more expensive than I to have your insurance through South Dakota. And so you might want to check with other people that are more uh, informational on this stuff. But I don't know if, you know, Texas is easy to establish residency through too. And I don't know if that makes a difference because I think South Dakota, when I tried, when I did our insurance, I said, why is it so expensive? They said, because of weather that it costs more. Um, I went over the types, class A, let's talk campground. So if you are on a budget and you're trying to minimize your expenses, you can absolutely get by on free camping. You can look on Campendium, uh, iOverlander are two apps that we use, and you can find free camping. Personally, we just don't. But it's, not our, it's not our style because I like to just have I love state parks. This is a state park right now. For the most part, we try state parks first. And then if we can't get state parks um, or county parks, but uh, national parks are amazing. And then occasionally we'll go to private RV campgrounds and it's hit or miss. You know, there's some that you can find for only $40 a night, but a lot of them, you know, KOA style are 80 to 90 a night. So obviously you have a huge range there. There's this beautiful campground. I know some full-time RVers stay at in Flagler Beach. I love that area or Beverly Beach. But I think they wanted 110 a night to stay there. And so, because I think that was just a ridiculous amount of money for the campground, we end up, we have a thousand trails. So I was just going to cover my two cents on having a thousand trails. Um, before I do that, the other ones are, um, I have to look up the name of it. Uh, forgot. We do thousand trails. Oh, harvest hosts. I have not used harvest hosts, so I can't tell you if it's worth it or if it's not worth it. Um, but I know a lot of people do use it. You can just stay a night at, at their, uh, campgrounds. I think you're only allowed one night. Uh, I actually don't even have a good Sam because we don't stay at private RV parks that often, but good Sam's worth it. If you would like private RV camp, RV parks. Uh, Passport America is the other one I couldn't think of. I don't have that, but a lot of people do use it to cut costs. Thousand Trails is great if, if uh, you're in certain states. So even then it's limited. You have a certain area. So we had our Thousand Trails because when we were in San Diego and just going back and forth for the winter, it was nice to have something as kind of a backup. But the campground is ugly and it's really far from everything. It seems like they always take trailer parks and make them thousand trails. So if you have a, if, if you end up moving into an RV and you're, you end up staying at a thousand trails all the time to save money, I think you're gonna wake up and be like, this was not the dream. I could be wrong. Like if you're doing it out of necessity, that's a different, that's a whole different story and that's okay. But I think for most people, if they're asking me, they're like, oh my gosh, I love what you do. How do you do it? What do you do? And I'm going to tell you like, I would never stand in, in a thousand trails unless it's out of necessity every so often. Um, remember there's like that rational and irrational brain. Well, mine likes to bounce back and forth a lot. And so rationally I'll go like, all right, well, we're, we're going to stick three nights here. And that just like changed our average to only $33 for the, a night for the month instead of 34. And it's like these weird games I'll play, but 
I'll also like wake up the next day and be like, well, this is a stupid game to play with myself. Um, yeah, we're leaving. And that's what we did recently because the campground in Florida, one of the thousand trails we're staying at was just so bad. I think so bad. So they're cheap. It's, it's about 40 bucks a month to have it. And the nice thing is if you do need to like use, just use it to get started on, you know, being able to afford it or figure it out and take one step at a time, right? The Martian, you solve one problem, then the next is you get to stay, I think, and the 40, that's the lowest range. I don't, I would not, not recommend going above the $40 a month. I think it was like, what does that come out to? A little over 400 for the year. Um, but you can have like two weeks. If you stay up to two weeks, you have to be out for a week and then you can go back in for two weeks. So you really could bounce between that and boondocking for, you know, well, for a whole year and then let, let that be a means to an end to kind of figure it out. And who knows, after a month you start figuring out, oh wait, I have more money, I can afford this now. Um, there, Thousand Trails in addition has a trails collection. That's another 300. And that's what we ended up doing because the actual Thousand Trails, you only get one little region and that one region isn't, um, that one region just, it, there were in Florida, there were only three campgrounds. So it didn't give me enough options. So we did that. You can ask a whole other thing on campgrounds. I already talked a little bit about food, um, cost of gas, how to look. The other thing is like fun and clothes. Okay. We don't spend on any of that. And that was worth when I first had this idea, I kind of said to the kids, like, you know, well, do you guys want me to buy this new thing, another toy? And, you know, for me, I, I caught myself in a house. I'm like, okay, I spend half my day just like organizing toys. All these toys go in this box. And then I go around picking them up and then putting a the box here. And you just, you walk through your life like a robot. I am picking up my stuff. And now I move my stuff to here. It's like the George Carlin stand up about our stuff. We have to move our stuff from here and then move over to here. And it's ridiculous. At some point you have to be like, what's the whole point of this? And so for us, it was really easy to be like, do you guys want me to buy you more stuff? Like you have all these toys you don't play with it. Or would you want me to go do fun things? And of course they're like, do fun things. Well, do fun things for us ended up being outdoor activities, hiking, just being in campgrounds, having time to breathe, to relax, to play, to start a campfire. It sounds silly or so simple, but there's a lot of value to it. And a lot of times your kids just want to be heard. So if you just had the time to actually hear them, you might catch that there's this hamster wheel we're on that we're so busy making enough money to buy our stuff and that we don't hear our kids. And so because our, we don't hear our kids, our kids want more stuff. And if we just at, take the stuff out of the equation and all of a sudden the circle looks like I'm listening to you, I'm attentive, what do you want? Oh, nothing. I'm good. Can we just go play catch? Can we just sit and, you know, carve, carve this branch with a knife? Like there's things that you can do that will completely reshape the amount of money you need for this. For clothes, we're kind of the same way too. Like we don't, well, we pretty much don't go into um, society very often. So we don't really care. Like Girls don't really care what we look like. Um, we don't have to, we don't have a lot of the stuff. I have a lot of kids, but we really just don't buy that much even clothes or stuff like that. And we don't do excursions. We don't, we don't treat with all the things we've traveled. In fact, yesterday, my video of the manatees on Instagram, I'll post it on YouTube soon. Uh, Gabby has to edit it because I'm not, I don't have permission to do video editing on YouTube, YouTube yet. Um, that was a big deal. That was only $130. And that was a big deal for me to like, all right, we're going to spend 130 and we're going to go kayaking. And dang, was it worth it? We saw six crocodiles and one was like massive, 15 to 20 foot. And then manatees that were like, you pretty much could touch them if you wanted to putting your hand in the water. That would be worth it. Um, but we didn't, we've traveled all over Europe, all over all over the world and we net we rarely have done any excursions and my kids are happy they're good with like if anything they appreciate it more they said thank you about a hundred times yesterday for for taking them on that one thing and so you know you can't let mom dad guilt get in the way it's it is 
there's so many things to do. Um, I'm going to link my other book, uh, A Thousand Miles of Memories, under here too, because in there, that was from the first year we traveled, and I talked about how I broke down budgeting. And we would say before we'd go on a trip, like, okay, well, what, you know, we can spend $500. Let's take a, take a vote. What do you guys want to spend $500 on? And I remember one year it was renting a boat at Lake Shasta, and we had, we had a great time doing that. But it's, if you treat RV living like a vacation, you will deplete your money really fast. So finding, just kind of reshaping your mindset on that. Um, I know there's only a few of you here and I have to wrap this up in five minutes. If anyone has any questions, let me know. I do really think that that nails the um, the specifics of how much it costs. You can make it cheap. You can make it really expensive too. There's no right or wrong way. If, if you're wanting to do it and you don't, and I think the big thing is you have to catch your excuse. You just, you really have to. We all have an excuse for, for things. When you can catch your excuse, it'll make it much easier to reverse engineer your desires. When you catch your excuse, it's much easier to reverse engineer your desires. Um, and if that's, you know, kind of foreign, like, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I don't get what you mean. Come on the 20th. I'm going to talk more about that. But that's, that's pretty much what I usually have to help people with because we have uh, really, we have a self-worth pandemic right now. It's like People don't understand their sense of individuality. They really haven't stepped into their own um, skill sets. And so this is a really happy, fun, enjoyable way to step into your skill set in life and to like take, take the reins on what it means to be you in this human form uh, living on planet Earth. And, you know, there's a whole web of uh, information coming at you telling you that you're not allowed to, you don't deserve to, there's so many risks, you better play it safe. Um, a lot of selfish people that say they love you and are going to say and, and blame you or guilt you for doing you. And that's, you know, you either can stay stuck in that or you can cut through the web and, and just really go inward and figure out like, what's the point of doing it to begin with. And then as soon as you commit to like, yeah, as soon as you commit, this is what I'm doing. Doors just open. They always have. We've zeroed out our accounts many times on this, on the last six and a half years, but new opportunities arise all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, Kathy, I'm gonna, I'm trying to stay like grounded in the fact that uh, your daughter's telling me I need to get out of Florida, but we won't go into that right now. But so crocodiles, I did not put my hand in with crocodiles. You know, the interesting thing with the crocodiles is that they want nothing to do with you. And they all actually, they reminded me of your brother They're, um They just sit in the sun and just bake and don't move. So I don't know if you know that about my dad. He just uh, loves the sun like a lizard except it's a crocodile same idea of it it was it was good yeah i would not put my hands in the water with crocodiles either definitely not all right you guys that wraps it up and um yeah feel free to email me if you have any questions all right thank you guys